Hello, Kingdom Living community, and welcome back to Rise Up. And today's episode is going to partner and connect really well to the last one on Riding the Storms. So back up and watch Riding the Storms, the Lord's business of shaking oppression so that you can get the fullness of this episode of Rise Up. Is he your king? Is he your king? Is Jesus Christ truly your king? And there is a resource for this, and I'll let Jesse explain it, but I'll tell you what it is. The resource for this episode is The Master of the Heart by Robert E. Spear. That's S P E E R. Um, so, Jesse, we're going right into it. We're, we're, we're dive bombing. We right are, into yeah. It. Is he I your king? I want to get king? into that. Um, this book was published in 1908 and um, it was just a little treasure that I found in one of the libraries or seminaries that um, I had been in in my early years and um, when I read it it just floored me because you know in seminaries there's a lot of discussion about the sovereignty of God and you would think you know scripture says that all sovereignty you know, he, he's the creator of the heavens, the earth. He's, you know, scripture says he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And yet, you know, when we begin to look at individually, um, you know, is he really our king of kings and our Lord of lords? And in this book, Master of the Heart, Robert Spear really gets into what does it mean if we say that Jesus is our Lord? And he he looks at the different scriptures through the Gospels um, and the Greek words used for Lord. He breaks those down in, in their meaning. And there's five major Greek words um, that are used throughout the Gospels um, in that term, you know, Lord. And he looks at what do those mean? And then he gets into what I call really the, you know, the power chapters where you're just like, oh my gosh, this is so good. And the only place it brought me was straight to my knees saying, Lord, I've sinned. You know, I, you're not, I have not allowed you to be the Lord over every area in my life. But it was more than that. It left me hungry. You know, what was pressing on my heart was, Jesus, I want you to be Lord over every area of my life. Like, I don't want to be withholding. I don't want to be walking in my own way or my own will I want that connection with you. I want to hear your voice in every matter. Like as I face things every day, I want to be like Corey Ten Boom, who literally would lay a map at, at your feet and would say, Lord, where do you want me to go? And I want to hear your voice and I want to obey. You know, I want to go where you want me to go. And I want to do your will. Like, that's my heart's cry. And in that, you know, that conversation, it really became the most endearing term to me because there was a lot, there was so much in my life that had to be surrendered and laid at his feet um, to allow him to have that place of lordship over all things, you know, when we break it down, a lot of people ask that question. You know, there were two main viewpoints that a lot of the scholars would take. You know, the first is, is, is the Lordship of Christ the type where, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of set the range. So we've talked about that, you know, the range in some past episodes with, um, you know, raising the standard Um, Does he just set a range and he says, as far as you're within that range, you're okay. You know, being outside of the range would mean that you're walking in sin. But as long as you're within that range, he doesn't care about the explicit details, like, you know, exactly what you eat. Like, he's not going to say, you know, this morning, get up. I want you to eat a bowl of 
oatmeal. I want you to, you know, have a cheeseburger for lunch with a Coke and then, you know, go on your merry way and, and do my work. You know, is the Lord going to give us those type of details? If, you know, I mean, have you ever had that happen? Does the Lord give you specific details about what he desires? He gives specific details about what he desires. And yeah, on a daily basis, it's not like have this or have that. But there are those times when it pertains to something in particular that he needs me to do, wants me to do. And sometimes it is just that matter of obedience where he's like, are you listening to me? Are you listening? Are you really listening? You know how huh? how moms give you that look. They're like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a difference like you know, so what's the difference between that where, you know, I think that if we're living within that range, the Lord is pleased with us, you know, he's pleased and, um, he's content with that, but what really stirs the passions of his heart? You know, how do we get that deeper, vibrant relationship? I think it's when we shift from just living in that range to saying, okay, Lord, I do want to know your thoughts every moment of the day. What is going to please you in this moment? Like I could just be like, okay, I'm going to go eat that, or I'm going to go over there today. And, you know, in that I'm going to be doing God's will, but Lord today, you take the lead, you know, not my work, not what I have to get done, not, you know, what I feel is walking in godliness, Lord, what specifically do you want, you know, and what do you do when he says, today, you're going to raise the dead, today, I'm calling you to to ha call down darkness on the earth, I'm calling you to stop the rain, like you did with Elijah, or you're going to face off with 850 prophets of Baal, and you're going to call down my fire from heaven. You know, how many of us expect those things, right? We're like, wait, no, I changed my mind, right? <laughs> like, that is old Testament stuff. <laughs> that is old school. Like, oh. <laughs> but when the Lord stands up and starts to shake, when we give him, that, you know, it's already his, it's his, he, you know, so what I mean by when we give him, you know, everything already is God's, but we're either in that place of fighting and contending saying, you know, Lord, I'm within your scope, your range, you should be happy with that, right? That's kind of what the Sanhedrin even though they weren't within that scope, but that's really what they did. You know, we're obedient to the law. Even Paul, what does Paul say? You know, I was the Sadducee of Sadducees, the Pharisees of Pharisees, meticulous. I kept every law. I was faultless, flawless, faultless, right? So, you know, are we holding that account up saying, God, here's my account. I have been absolutely faultless in everything. You've got nothing to say, right? We, we could say that, but that's not what he wants. He wants the person who's going to be willing to lay everything down that you're, you know, it's not off your merits. It's not off you, what you do. It's, are we in his house and in his courts with him. It's all about, you know, the connection with his Holy Spirit. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to come to rest upon us and to lead us in his way? Do we allow that? And how many of us have had that experience? You know, when, when is the last time? You had an encounter with this, you know, the Holy Spirit of God where you knew there was no doubt in your mind that the Spirit of God was present and the Lord was moving. He was speaking. He was showing you things in his word. He was showing you his plan of action, what he desired 
you know, the good works that he desired for you to do. Um, when's the last time you've had that encounter? And that's what we're talking about when we ask the question, is he your king? Is he the one that, you know, when you think about that, uh, somebody who would be an advisor for the king who, you know, would be that person who's going to be the face front, they're going to go out and address the people. Moses and Aaron were like that. You know, they were the, they would go into the Lord's presence. They would, you know, hear what he had to say, and then they would go out and they would put his, his plan into action. Um, before the people and that's what the lord's looking for but in order to do that you have to be willing to enter into the tent of meeting you know moses literally set up a tent where you know he would go out every day he and joshua would go to that tent of meeting it talks about it in um exodus 33 where they would go and they the presence of the lord would come we went over that passage where, you know, you caught that verse where it was like, literally the people would stand and watch as he went out. They would watch for that, you know, cloud by day to fall. And they would know that the Lord was in there talking to Moses. And it was an, a tent where they could inquire. They could ask of the Lord things. And so let's get into that. You know, what does it mean that he is the king of your life. Uh, let's start by reading uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and yeah. see. Oops, sorry. Would you yeah, like me to continue? Going. Okay. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Yeah. So just starting with that last part, um, you know, when, when we are actively abiding or dwelling in the presence of the Lord and under his headship, there is an exaltation that is seen and experienced by the nations and by the heathen. That's what it says. You know, be still and know that I am God. When we know, and that Hebrew word for know is, is very interesting. Um, you know, it, it's a very intimate term and used in connection to, um, you know, to describe that relationship between a man and a wife. So it's used in the context of a covenant relationship. Um, where you intimately know the other individual. And, you know, when we, I guess that's kind of the difference when, when we think about the range of what God allows, that puts us in the place of head knowledge. We have a head knowledge of knowing about what the word says about God and about what his will is and you know, we're just in that place. We've got the head knowledge. But do we intimately in relationship know what he desires that day, that moment? That's, you know, the difference is that, you know, to have that intimate knowing we there has to be the relational aspect. Amen. Amen. 
And so, you know, I love this passage because it really ties it all together. You know, God himself is our refuge. What is a refuge? What is a refuge, Tracy? A refuge is a, a place of safety that you can run into um, and and be there and be, be hidden, be safe, be covered over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so literally he is that place where we can go. Um, I love that you use that word, that covering, that headship. Um, you know, and when we run into his presence, you know, I almost think of it as like, when I think about that place, it takes me to Psalm 91. Um, do you want to pull that up and read that quick about what it says about that refuge? Oh, sure. My goodness. It's a Psalm 91 day. Let's start <laughs> right. Last night was Psalm 91. This morning it was Psalm 91. Uh, now it's Psalm 91. Um, whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high, of the most high. I'm, I'm, I'm so there. I'm like, we're hiding. We're hiding in the most high. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress my God and whom I trust. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's that imagery of, you know, that his wings are over like a mother hen. He covers us with those wings and pulls us close into that place. You know, where is the shadow of the Lord? It literally was right by his chest underneath his arms, you know, is how it describes it. And um, that place closest to his heart you know, are we in that place? John, the the disciple John found that place. You know, it said that he would recline at the table, leaning his head against the Lord's chest, you know, and think about that. He was one of the sons of thunder, you know, one of those the fishermen that was a brute, <laughs> him and his brother, uh, James, you know, and they would be like doing all sorts of stuff, you know, just rough around the edges. <laughs> and yet here was this rough around the edges guy who found that place to rest. Yeah, you know, I love that. There's that concept of the resting again, you know, <laughs> where literally, um, you know, that resting became the image of um, the abiding. Um, so, you know, we look at that further. And why don't you read verse five again in that? Let me go back. Where was I? I was in Psalm 46. Yes. Oh. Okay. And okay. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. But yeah, he's within her. Oh. Mm -hmm. I love that verse about, you know, there is a, there is a city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the most high tabernacles, plural, you know, and uh, God is in the midst of her and his kingdom, you know, his tabernacles, his place on high shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right and early. And even though the heathens raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God who has all the angelic armies, all the hosts of heaven um, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. What a powerful verse. Um, let's read some others here about his his kingdom, his authority, uh, his being with us. Uh, why don't you read Matthew one twenty three? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yeah, that was you know, a proclamation verse that um, part of the good news, you know, part of that good news that we can hear is that God is with us. 
Mm. Um, he was the one that was prophesied that, you know, in Isaiah nine, that was the prophecy of the coming Messiah um, that, you know, unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given mm -hmm. and the government shall be on his shoulders. And, you know, the fulfillment of that is his name that he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us you know he is our god and we are his people let's uh read matthew 28 20 matthew let me go back over there matthew 28 20 and teaching them to obey everything i've commanded you and surely i am with you always to the very end of the age yeah so this was you know where does the authority come in the great commission this really is part of that great commission starting at verse 16 it says uh do you want to go ahead and go back and read it from <laughs> verse 16 on I gotta go back. I already went back to John. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm sorry. Matthew, sorry. Okay, what was like 28. Matthew 28. 20, Matthew 16. 28. Verse 16. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they had, saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yep with us as you know that concept of the king who's with us who's the lord um you know if he's with us it there's a distinct connection between his being with us and him being our king our lord right mm -hmm. um let's read we're going to skip one of them we had looked at but let's look at john 14 16 through 17 and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Yeah. So we begin to look at that concept of the Holy Spirit, uh, the one who rests upon um, you know, we see that all throughout the Old Testament, the spirit of God descending and resting, um, you know, in order for the Holy Spirit to find that place where he can rest. You have to have removed all the rods of oppression. He can't rest and have you can't have the government, you know, carried on your shoulder if you're carrying something else. Everything else has to be shaken off and removed, um, which is, you know, what is it? It's all the things that oppress and burden us, which is why he says, cast your cares, cast those burdens off. You know, um, what's the one verse in Matthew? Um, uh, take my yoke upon you. So there's you know, a different yoke. We're not to carry the yoke of oppression or, or a heavy burden. We're to take his yoke, which what is that? What is his yoke? His yoke is light. The burden is light. Yoke is easy. Burden is light. Right. But what do you think that is? What is it that rests upon him? that he has that he gives to us well it's the the government there's a conveyance of the kingdom that came to his children like that was completely conveyed over the government the kingdom all of that was conveyed over the holy spirit you know, yes, who the holy is spirit mm -hmm. who is that government and you know yeah. that rests upon mm -hmm. and um yeah so let's get into Psalm 139, 
And we'll start with verses 7 through 12. Hmm. 7 to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Is that ending in verse 12? Oh, nope, that was not. Okay. If Sorry, I, I was say, catching up looking really? for it as you nope, were finishing. Nope, that was... <laughs> That was me. You even said it. I hear the chapter and then the verses go right out of my head and I can't hang on to them. So uh, verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. There we go. <laughs> yes. So again, that, you know, the Holy Spirit his presence that, you know, where can we go from his presence? We can't, you can't know, run from love. doesn't matter if it's the heights, the depths, there isn't anywhere where he cannot see us or be. Uh, there isn't any place he cannot reside with us. Um, he's there. He sees everything, including, you know, he goes even to the, the very beginning of our creation. Um, you know, and the Holy Spirit's work in that. If you would read Psalm 30 or the same Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That's a big old, ah! oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so powerful, huh? That mm -hmm. even in that that place, you know, he sees our unformed uh, bodies uh, and knows, you know, it goes into that intimacy, you know, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. So, so powerful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as we go further into that, let's look at, let's turn to Psalm 145 verses 1 through 13. Five. I will exalt you. My God, the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Amen. 
He certainly is. And, you know, as we do, as we look at that, um, let's get into the conversation of how do we, you know, how does he become the king or master of our heart? I think this really is, you know, where it sets it up. Um, you know, as I'm reading this um, quote from Master of the Heart, I would like you to just let's look through Psalm 145 and discuss how, you know, how do we give him that place as king? Um, on page 223 um, of Master of the Heart, it's titled, the uniqueness of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And Spear writes, It is a very significant fact that in our thoughts about men, we are unable to come to the life of Christ without an altered feeling. This is true even if we have been thinking of religious men, of men to whom we owe some debt of the deepest character, towards whom our temper is naturally reverent. As we pass one after another of these men before our eyes and our gaze falls at last on Christ, no matter how loving our thoughts may have been, they are touched with a new tenderness and a new reverence deepens into awe. And this is equally true if we turn from the thought of men as religious leaders and think of them just as men who have swayed the minds and wills of our fellow men. We cannot think about Jesus Christ in any such list of men with the same feeling with which we think of others. There is not one other great leader about whom we cannot speak humorously or um, jo he says it's jostly. I think he means like, jo you know, kind of like jolly, mm -hmm. if we wish, or with a little pleasantry. But we cannot speak in that way about our Lord. When we come to him, it is through a still small voice whispered in our ears, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Mm -hmm. When we stand in, in his presence, you know, really, that's just it. We're standing in his presence, which is that place of the fullness of his glory the fullness of his authority, the place where he is exalted. And um, how do we do that? So have to time, yield, yield, time surrender. to take off your <laughs> shoes tonight when you yes. go for prayer, take off your shoes mm -hmm. and just say, you are my king, you are my Lord. I exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. So that's one of the ways we can exalt and um you know, his lordship and kingship is by sharing, you know, with one generation to another, the great works he has done. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Um, here's where prayer shifts, you know, instead of just bringing our petitions our you know, the things we need, the things we lack, you know, are we thinking about his glorious splendor and majesty, the wonderful works he's done, the awesome things that he has, that, you know, is behind his power, his might. Do we proclaim his deeds? Um, do we celebrate his abundance, goodness, and sing of his righteousness? Do we think about his gracious and compassion, his graciousness and his compassion, how slow he is to anger, how rich is mm -hmm. his love. 
he's so good to all. Do we think about that? Um, all of his works are a praise to him. And your faithful people extol you. Uh, those who are faithful in his house, they exalt his name in these things. They tell of the glory of his kingdom and speak of his might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures through all generations. And he here is a trustworthy statement. Mm. He is faithful to all his promises and in all he does. He upholds all who fall and upholds all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, Lord, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He is near. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I encourage you all to pray that prayer this week. Um, you know, there is no one like him. I mean, you can't get a better. There's so many great prayers through the Psalms, but you know, when we're talking about his lordship, his headship, you don't get much better than Psalm 46 and Psalm 145. You know, <laughs> if you got to pray him every day, but start to think about, you know, what does that, what does it entail for him to be master of your heart and the king, your king? Uh, what does that look like? So we're going to enter into just a moment of prayer here. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, you are, your word says, Jesus, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord. We just come, we come into your presence and we just lay everything down. We ask you to be Lord of our lives. We ask you to be our King today and every day. We ask that you would show us what this looks like, how to live in that place where we are giving you that position of headship in our lives. We ask that not our will be done, but that thy will be done. We ask that your kingdom will come, that all honor, all glory, all praise shall be yours and yours alone. Lord, I ask that for all those who come, that they would know that you are with them, that they would feel your presence, that they would feel that closeness, that they would hear your voice, and know you are speaking to them, that you are guiding, that you are giving counsel, you are directing, but most of all, that you are with, you are with us. We thank you, we praise you, we exalt you, we ask to know the glories of your majesty and splendor. We ask to know and see and experience and witness your great works that we may testify to the world that you alone are God, that you are our God and we are your people. We ask this in your powerful name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Amen. All right. See you next time. <laughs>